looking very handsome. Oh, what a nice thing. All right, and I'm rolling, and when you're ready, just go ahead. Go ahead. So does our sexuality define us as a human being? Uh, yes, it does. Nobody's quite sure why. We're not sure whether our identity as sexual beings is defined by the culture or whether it's defined by some biological, physiological dimensions of who we are. Are women physiologically different? I mean, the obvious differences, but then are our brains different? Uh, that becomes one of the great questions of our contemporary society. I think that we need to look at this thing. Uh, and uh, having taught at a secular university, I was able to, this is the one place where I was able to talk about Jesus uh, in a secular university. Because um, Jesus represents what Carl Jung, the psychologist, really wanted people to be. Carl Jung said, there is this thing called being a complete, actualized human being. There is this ideal. What does it mean to be a complete, idealized, actualized human being? And interestingly enough, that comes about in Jesus. Uh, he doesn't fit the stereotypical male. He doesn't fit the stereotypical female. For those who are on the uh, men's thing, you know, Jesus is a real he-man. There's stuff that will support that. You know, he goes to his hometown, Nazareth. He declares himself to be the Messiah. They take him to the edge of town. They're going to throw him over a cliff. He doesn't call down angels. He doesn't strike people dead. He simply turns on the crowd, a mob, ready to push him over the cliff, stares them down, walks right at them. The crowd divides, says the scripture, and he walks through the midst of them, and nobody lays a hand on him. Whoa, is this tough. And then he goes into the temple with a whip. Uh, they were at least a hundred different booths where men were selling things like pigeons and doves and sheep for slaughter in the temple, exchanging money, and he knocks over all the ta tables. I always said to my students, who are mostly Jewish at the University of Pennsylvania, anybody that takes on a hundred Jewish businessmen all by himself, that's tough. <laughs> so if you want these images of, of tough, you know, and he could be very tough. Um, before Pilate, there's this great scene. And Jesus has been relatively silent, like the sheep that are led before their sharers. He doesn't say much until Pilate pushes him a little bit too far and said, um, and said do you know who I am? Do you know what I can do to you? Because Jesus is remaining silent. And Jesus, I mean, here's tough. He's talking to Pilate. The guy who's got power over life and death over him from Pilate's point of view. He looks at Pilate and he says, you wouldn't have any power unless it was given to you. Jeez. And you see suddenly this, you push me too far. I got to tell you, I'm not using my power, but I could right now. Uh, you get this image. Then you get over here and you get this Jesus going to his disciples. Hey, fellas, look at the lilies over there. Aren't they lovely? Oh, I'd like to have a vase of them right on the living room table. I, I don't think Solomon in all of his glory was arrayed like any of these. Um, he looks over the city, and he, his analogy is to a woman. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft would I have gathered together as a hen, gathered her brood. You say, a hen? You're comparing yourself to a mother hen? And so you see this 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 Jesus is a perplexing figure. He's all that a man should be, but on the other hand, he's all that a woman should be. And uh, Carl Jung says that in Jesus, and he was not a Christian, a disciple of uh, Sigmund Freud, uh, that somehow he embodies both the idealization of man, the idealization of women, and this is what a human being should be. This is what a human being should be. And then Carl Jung goes on to say this. The culture we live in has taken what it means to be human and said to men, these are the ways you're allowed to be human. 
and all these other ways we're going to assign to women, you can be human as society says you're supposed to be. We say to women, you're going to be human insofar as society says a woman should be. Hence, part of our humanity gets suppressed. The men have suppressed in them uh, gentleness, kindness, sweetness, empathy, caring, connectedness. All of this is suppressed in them. Women have suppressed in them assertiveness, uh, strength of character, um, commitment to philosophical ideas. You know, my, my wife is a perfect example of it. She loves it when I talk about practical things when I preach. All I have to do is start talking about philosophical concepts or theological concepts. And she said, it just doesn't, I mean, it's all good and well, and I guess the men in the audience really loved all that stuff, but it's not for me. Question, why isn't it for you? Why are men so interested in the metaphysical and the women so concerned with the physical? Uh, let me give you an example. We moved into the dormitory at Eastern University where I taught for so many years. And uh, it's before the students arrive. And I'm the dorm proctor. New pro faculty member, you get that job. So I take Peggy on a tour of this men's dormitory and we get to the shower room. And she looks in the shower room and she gasps. And I said, what's the matter? She said, it's just a tile room. And, and they're just faucets, uh, 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 shower heads uh, coming out of the wall. And I said, well, where else would they come from? And she said, are you telling me that 10 guys get in there together naked and shower together naked? I never thought about it in these obscene terms before. But the truth is, yes. As a matter of fact, when I was a student at that very university, some of the best discussions I had on philosophy and, and science took place in that shower, under the armpits. We were discussing things, great insights, totally detached from the physical realities of life. That's men totally detached from the physical realities of life. Women, on the other hand, are very sensitive to the physical realities of life. If they're going to shower, they want a little booth with a door that they can close. I was telling, talking about this at Indiana University in the United States. It was very fascinating. A um, guy came up afterwards and he said, last year, uh, the boiler in the women's dormitory blew up and we had to move the women out because it was the middle of winter and they were freezing. There was only one building available. It was the army barracks. We have an army training program on the campus. Oh, it was this Quonset hut, beds lined up, 50 on each side. And I said, and they couldn't handle it. Oh no, he said they could handle that. The problem that they couldn't handle was this. At the end of the Quonset hut, there was a wall and a door and inside there were 12 toilets with no barriers between them. Now you have to understand, with guys this is no problem. You know, they're sitting there reading the paper, hi Charlie, how you doing Bill? You know, they are totally detached from the physical realities of life. On the other hand, you could, he said, at this, when these women were there, 12 toilets, they would line up and they would go in one at the time. This sensitivity to the physical side of life. Women are very sensitive to the physical. Men live in a world in which they're de totally distracted. I mean, you're leaving the house, your wife says, you're going out dressed like that? I said, what's the matter? You're, the colors you're wearing clash. That's why I wear black all the time now. I don't want it to clash. They clash. Does, do men ever notice when colors clash? Or you're wearing a check and a stripe? They don't go together. Women notice these things. Women, what is it about the culture that has nurtured this in women? The great thing about Jesus, is he concerned about the spiritual side of life? Oh, you bet he is. Does he understand the spiritual dimensions of human existence? Did he not come to save people from their sin? Is he concerned about the joy and the peace and the patience and the love that people should possess, of course. 
Is he concerned about the physical side of life? When he sees people who are sick, does he want to heal them? Does he not want to raise the dead? Does he, not want, does he not want to cure the blind? In short, he refuses to separate the physical from the metaphysical. He deals with the physical needs of people. He deals with the spiritual needs of people. Women are prone to focus on the physical. Men are prone to phys- focus on the metaphysical. Jesus is the combination of both. That's what Carl Jung would say. In order to become a complete human being, women have to assume some of the traits that the culture has suppressed in them, and men must do the same. Let me give you another dichotomy. Um, Another dichotomy would be that women tend to be very person-oriented, and men tend to be very principle-oriented. Once again, you say, well, I'm not sure I understand that. There's a, there was a place just outside of a little community where we live called uh, the Valley Forge Music Circus. It was a place where you could go and see Broadway shows without having to go into downtown Philadelphia. Middle class people in the suburbs go to this thing. Middle class people never arrive ahead of time, nor do they arrive late. If the program's starting at eight o'clock, 20 minutes before eight, Nobody's there. 15 minutes before the show starts, everybody starts arriving. They arrive in mass. So on Highway 202, which is in front of the Valley Ford Music Circus, nothing's there until a quarter to eight. Simultaneously, 2,000 automobiles show up. And they're all trying to squeeze into this one parking lot. And my friend and his wife are like in the second car coming into the parking lot. The... Uh, Attendant comes over and says, excuse me, sir, 50 cents if you're going to park for parking. My friend whips out the newspaper and he shows him in the ad in the newspaper. It says free parking. The guy says, this is a 50 cent donation to charity. My friend said, I gave at the office. The guy says, mister, don't give me a hard time. You don't give me the 50 cents. You don't park here. My friend said, that's okay. He rolls up the windows, locks the door. His car is blocking the only entrance to the parking lot. Time is unfolding. People in the other cars have rolled down their windows. They are yelling obscenities at him. Yea, they are making religious statements which have no theological content. He's got his arms folded. He's not budging. In the meantime, his wife has crawled under the dashboard. And she's yelling, give him the 50 cents. It's a lousy 50 cents. And here's her line. Listen to her line. Everybody's looking at us. What's she concerned about? People. Everybody's looking at us. She's afraid of how this behavior is affecting other people. His response is, it's not the 50 cents. It's the principle of the thing. He's concerned about the principle. She's concerned about the person. Jesus is the perfect combination, you see. There's the woman caught in adultery. The principle, the laws laid down by Moses says she should be stoned to death. That's the principle. She's broken the law. This is what's supposed to happen. They're holding up the principle. It's sin. Sin must be taken seriously. He, on the other hand, looks at this woman, battered and beaten. with her head down. He starts writing in the dirt and he says, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. He upholds the principle too, right? I mean, the only people that have the right to to stone this woman are the ones who have not committed the sin. And one by one, they all drift away. And then Jesus says to the woman, where are thine accusers? She looks around, she says, they're all gone, Lord. Neither do I accuse thee. Go thy way. And once again, he's going to affirm the principle. Sin no more. This is not to be taken lightly. Yeah. Is he empathetic towards the person? In her pain, in her suffering? Yes, he is. Does he uphold principles? Yes. You have no right to throw stones unless you are without sin. And to the woman, don't think I'm just letting you off the hook. 
You have a responsibility because of the grace that has been shown to you. Sin no more. That person versus principle. Let me give you another dichotomy. See, no. Young would say Jesus incarnates the best elements of both. He is, in fact, very sensitive to the person, very committed to the principles. When he put them on trial, what's his word? Concerning the laws of Moses, concerning Torah, I have not broken a single one of them. Has he upheld the principles of the Hebrew Bible? Has he upheld the principles of the Old Testament? You bet he has. Yeah. He's a principled person. But he is very, as a matter of fact, here's another dichotomy. Men are totally insensitive to people. My wife has to remind me of this constantly, of my insensitivity. I remember going to a gathering one time uh, where there were a bunch of academics and uh, the issue of God came up and I was ready. You know, when you're around as old as I am, you're ready. Because every stupid argument you've ever heard against God and against Christianity, you've heard. And you know how you always think up the answer that you should have given 20 minutes later? Well, the interesting thing is when you're old as I am, the same questions come up and you're ready the next time. So this young guy who's so snotty starts talking about how stupid could you. I blow him out of the water and the people gather around as I hold forth brilliantly and academically destroy this guy in front of his colleagues. And on the way home, I say to my wife, well... What did you think? I had defended the faith. I had stood up for truth. I had stood up for truth. And she says, I've never been so embarrassed in my life. You see, I'm concerned about upholding truth. She's concerned about this poor guy that's been humiliated in front of her friend, his friends. You know, got another one. I always do this with my students. You're dating this girl. I remember this happening when I was a student. Guy comes back to the dormitory room. He said, you won't believe what happened. I said, what happened? He said, I walked Jane home tonight. We got to the door. And when I was ready to make my move to embrace her and kiss her, she held me off and said, John, there's something I've been trying to tell you. I, I don't know how to say this nicely, but friendship, friendship is, uh, is perhaps more important than romance. If a guy's listening to this, let me tell you, fella, when they give you that friendship bit, it's over. So what happens is he says, uh, I, I'm your friend, but, but the, what I'm really saying, John, is we need to establish some distance right now and stand back from, he comes back to the dormitory and he says to me, Campolo, you won't believe what happened. Out of a clear blue sky. Well, it wasn't out of a clear blue sky. For the three weeks leading up to that event, she has been dropping hints. It's over. It's done. The way in which she's conducted herself, the way in which she sat, the way in which she talked to him. She was trying to send a thousand nonverbal messages that this thing was done. Does he ever get the nonverbal communication? Never. you got to come out and bang him on the head with it. He doesn't get it. Men just don't get it. Reverse it. I'm dating this girl. I'm going to break up with her, but I'm going to do it gently. I go to pick her up for a date. I walk in. She looks at me and she says, what's wrong? What do you mean, what's wrong? What's wrong? Nothing's wrong. Look, get your coat. Let's go. Something's wrong. We get in the car. You put the key in the ignition. She puts her hand over the ignition. We're not going anywhere until you tell us what's, tell me what's come up. What's come between us? She instinctively senses what, that the relationship is in trouble. It, I mean, how many times as a counselor I've had to counsel people, and the guy comes in and says, a horrible thing happened. I called you because this morning I, I came home from work. I went to the work shift, night shift, and I came home. There was a note on the table. My wife's left me for another man. And I look at the guy and say, and when did you realize this relationship was in trouble? You know what he says? I didn't know anything was wrong. How could your wife be carrying on an affair with a man other than yourself? How can this whole marriage have fallen apart 
and he not be sensitive to it. The insensitivity of men is legendary. They just don't get it. Contrast this with Jesus, of whom it says, he knew what was in people. Ah, there's a line. He knew what was in people. Wow, that, that ability to take on this human trait, sensitivity, empathy, relating in depth to another person. Peggy is a good example of the ultimately empathetic person. We'll walk into a room, a party or something, and she'll look around. She will immediately spot the person who's lonely, the person who doesn't have any happiness, and, and for the rest of the evening, that's where her attention will be, not me. I will be attracted to the bright and with it, articulate persons. If, if President Clinton's in the room, I'm going to be talking to President Clinton. She'll be talking to that little soul over on the right that came with her husband and everybody else is milling around and nobody's talking to her. It's more important for her to empathize with the person who is hurting. As a matter of fact, Jung would say the dichotomy goes a step further. Men are attracted to strength. Women are attracted to weakness. That's a strong, interesting thing to say. And men are stupid because we think, we think that if we can come across as a he-man, that'll really turn her on. I always would say to my students, when I was in the university, I was on the university basketball team. I was captain of the team. I thought that would do it. Scoring baskets, doing something hero, being, you know, Man, that would do it. And I'd always say to my students, that's me at 20. Thinking that if I can show her my heroic side, my masculine side, my tough side, my he-man side, that would really turn her on. I say, here I am at 40. I've mastered poetry. What's more is I've become pretty adept at interpreting art. At 20, I want to take her to the basketball game and have her to come down and smell my smir smelly jersey at the end of the game. At 40, I want to take her to the art museum and show her paintings by Monet and explain how Monet used light and how various paintings of the same scene depict how light changed for him and, and the poetry that he recited. And, the, and I ask you a simple question. Here comes the 40-year-old version of me with poetry and artistic appreciation. And the 20-year-old version, the scoring baskets. We're both competing for a 25-year-old woman. Who do you think's going to win? The guy that's into sensitivity and sweetness. The tough men are attracted to weak strength. Women are attracted to weakness. Oh, he's so sweet. He's so sensitive. He's so caring. Here's a woman, here's a hot man, her husband. They have two children. One is strong, star of the uh, rugby team. Um, he's president of the class, straight A student. The other one never was quite all there. It's kind of weak and sickly and walks with a little bit of a limp and getting C's and C minuses in his report card. There's these two sons. Which of the two is, going to fa is the father going to say, that's my boy? And which of the two is the mother going to say, that's my boy? She will empathetically relate to the weak one. Which is best? The answer is Jesus related to both. He could look at the rich young ruler who comes running. I love that phrase. He comes running to Jesus and he's rich. Undoubtedly, he was handsome. Obviously, he was energetic as he comes running to Jesus. And it says this, and Jesus beholding him, loved him. I, how could he help but love this guy with all his vibrant strength? On the other hand, show Jesus a lame man, a crying child. Show him a little boy who's crying because he can't sit on Jesus' lap. Where will Jesus go? He'll go for both. That balance. In short, I would always be able to 
lay the trip on my students by saying, how could you not believe that Jesus is the incarnation of God? Because the human race was created to be in the image of God. But culture has taught men to suppress certain traits that are now assigned only to women. And women are trained to suppress certain traits that are only assigned to men. And this is why we need to surrender to the work of the Holy Spirit. Because only the miracle of the Spirit will enable us to overcome this dichotomy and become holistic persons. Jesus said, I have can't come to make men and women, here's the word, whole, whole. Yes, our sexuality does define us. Because the culture has decided what a man should be like and what a woman should be like. And Jesus comes and shatters our culturally prescribed definitions of masculinity and femininity. And he says to both men and women, become like me. So a woman looking at Jesus doesn't ever have to say, I could never be like Jesus. Yes, you can. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, this mind can be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can recover those dimensions of what it means to be human that the culture has suppressed in your personhood. And to the men, exactly the same thing. So yes, our sexuality does define, does define who we are. But Carl Jung said, if we're going to be complete human beings, we've got to recover those dimensions of our personhood that the culture has suppressed in us. You know what the problem with Carl Jung is? He never tells us how. That's the problem with almost all of psychotherapy, all of psychology, all of psychoanalysis. They're great in telling us what's wrong with us. Oh, they'll psychoanalyze us and say you had poor toilet training at the age of four or something else. I don't know what it is that screws you up. But after they tell you what screws you up, they don't tell you how to get out of it. They act as though insight is deliverance. Once you understand what's your background, it's always that way in the movies, right? Once the person has the aha experience, He's cured. It's not that simple. Once you tell me why I'm a frustrated, uptight, old, crotchety fart, you haven't solved the problem. You've only explained why I am the way I am. Young does that brilliantly. He doesn't tell you how to overcome the dichotomy of masculinity and femininity that the culture has created. But that's where the gospel is such good news. It empowers us to recreate the other side of our humanity that the culture has taught us to suppress and calls us to be whole persons. To men, I say, become like Jesus. To women, I say, become like Jesus. And insofar as we become like Jesus, it's, it says in Galatians 3.28, there is neither male nor female. We become one in Christ Jesus. Yeah. <laughs>